welcome once again to our uh, science lesson, the topic being biotic factors. And we have already found out the meaning of biotic factors, living factors, living organism, how they are going to interact and in the process produce interactive, special interactive relationships, one of them being pollination. So the word pollination is coming from the word pollen. Pollen. We know the source of pollen grains in plants. So it's a major interactive special relationship in plants, main, mainly for plants. So pollination, pollen grains, coming from pollen, which is pollen grains, and we know the source of pollen grains in plants, flowers. Flowers. So before we move even further, we can just remind ourselves the structure of the flower structure of the flower, typical structure. When I talk of typical, it means not all flowers will have the same structure, but slightly will follow the same. So if that is So that is the structure of a flower and those, if it is a typical flower, the one that are large, conspicuous, maybe sometimes brightly colored, although in some flowers it's dull, they are called the petals. Petals. And then the lower part of the petals, we have slightly green. Uh, Membranous structures called the sepals. The sepals. This one are also given the name corolla. Sepals are given the name calyx. And then we have very major parts. I did not complete here. We have the major part here, the ovary. We have the anthers. We have the filament. Uh, we have the stigma. And then we have style. Style. That is the flower stalk. Now this is just a reminder because in other levels you have already gone through this. Also called the pedicel the flower stalk, the pedicel. So when you talk of pollination, we are talking about pollen grains. Source of pollen grains are those structures, the others. So when you have transfer of pollen grains, this one releases those small structures of pollen grains until they fall on another structure called the stigma. We call that process as pollination. So the structure that releases, the structure that releases pollen grains is the male part of the flower. The male part of the flower. The male part of the flower uh, is called the pistil. But the one that receives a stigma, style, and ovary is the female part of the flower. We call it stamen. So if we have transfer of pollen grains from the others to the stigma of the female part of the flower, we call that one as pollination. But it must stick, the pollen grains must stick on the stigma of that flower. So it's sometimes it could be within the same flower 
or it can the pollen grains can be carried to a stigma of a different flower but within the same species so if it is going to a different flower of a different plant but of the same of the same species we call that one as cross pollination but if it is within members of the same species flowers of the same species then we call that one as self pollination cross pollination to another flower self pollination within the same uh, flower or for the same flower for the same plant so after pollination after the transfer of pollen grains it does not just stick here it will germinate pollen grains will germinate due to factors on the stigma forming a pollen tube so we can just slightly look at that again so before you go further definition of pollination we have said is the transfer is the transfer of pollen grains pollen grains from the answers it could be it could be one one answer or many two the stigma to the stigma of another flower to the stigma of the flower stigma of Of the flower of same plant, same plant, or different plant, but this must be of the same species, different plant, but of same, same species. So I'm saying if it is this plant A, plant B, we have a flower here it is releasing to this flower to the same flower and then maybe from this to a stigma of a different flower so if it is to a different flower you have said this is cross pollination if it is within or on the same plant we shall call that one a self pollination self pollination self pollination pollen grains from the anthers or from the flower to the stigma on the same plant if it goes to the stigma of a different plant but commonness here same species then we call that one as cross pollination so the word same species is important because if the pollen grains will cross to a plant of different species, then we are not going to have pollination. We are going to have something different. We cannot call that one as pollination. But now the question is, after pollination, what happens? After pollination, I've said the stigma, the pollen grains will germinate on the stigma and it will produce a projection called a pollen tube so it germinates on the stigma and forms a pollen tube so after landing on the stigma it will form a pollen tube So we can use this diagram again to explain what happens slightly style then ovary that's the female part the gynoesium gyno gynoesium gyno gynoesium gynoesium is simply meaning female part of a flower female part stigma style ovary gynoesium 
So we have a pollen grain has landed on that. Stigma has sugary substances and other conditions that will make that makes this grain to germinate into a projection. Into a projection. So that projection is called pollen tube. So it forms a pollen tube that will carry the male nuclei, the male nuclei to the ovary. Specific part of that ovary is called the embryo sac. Embryo sac. So it goes into the embryo sac carrying at the tip male nuclei. And then there will be fusion fusion one two three four five six seven eight those are nuclei that are found in the embryo sac so it will now get into the embryo sac the male nuclei will get into the embryo sac releasing the two male nuclei one fuses with that part and then the other one fuses with this part. So what we should know is that the pollen tube carries male nuclei into the embryo sac. And in the embryo sac, we shall have fertilization. So fertilization takes place. This fertilization is important because it will allow for formation of a zygote. And it is this I got that now develop into an ovule. It develops into an ovule. So pollination does not stop just by transfer of pollen grains to the stigma. There will be growth of pollen tube to carry the male nuclei into the embryo sac, allowing fertilization to take place, forming a zygote, which later develops into an ovule. So we should note that after fertilization, after pollination, after pollination, fertilization occurs. Fertilization occurs. Fertilization occurs due to fusion of male nuclei there are two two of them male nuclei with nuclei in the ovary I don't want to use other terms ovary is enough we call it embryo sac. So after pollination, the fertilization occurs due to fusion of male nuclei with male nucle with with nuclei in the ovary to form. It is going to form a zygote. To form a zygote. But our lesson is not on the physiology of fertilization and pollination, but it's a, an interaction. So what we should know is what is going to cause pollination and how is it going to affect the distribution of other living organisms. So pollination is usually carried out. Pollination is carried out by either animals And in this case, we are going to find the type of animals or physical or physical agents. Physical agents. So, animals and physical agents that will allow transfer of pollen grains are called called pollinating agents pollinating agents. 
So these pollinating agents are very important because they'll affect distribution of the plants and even animals in the process. So some of the animals involved in pollination include So pollinating agents, we have said they could be animals. They could be animals. These animals we have already mentioned, or you can be able to mention some of them, mainly insects. Insects form a very huge part, insects. We also have other type of animals, very common insects, we have bees, moth, butterfly. We have other like birds, birds, the nectar suckers. We also have these birds, and we have some mammals. Some mammals also are involved. Other category of pollinating agents we have mentioned as physical. Physical agents, majorly is wind. Wind. That's why we have what you call wind pollinated flowers. And the other physical agent is water. So if plants are growing where we have a flow of water currents, it can also carry pollen grains from one flower to another flower, but of the, of the same species. So these are called pollinating agents. So how are they important? Pollinating agents are important because they can affect the distribution, uh, abundance, and locality of other organisms. In other words, if we want to find bees, if you want to locate or you want to study bees very easily, sometimes you not to go to the beehive. Just find where we have a flower farm or where we have a garden, and that garden has plants that is a flowering, you'll find nearly all of this. You'll find moth, you'll find butterflies, you'll find bees hovering from one flower to another. We call that behavior as foraging. They'll be foraging from one flower to the other, moving from one flower to another, foraging. And we know the reason. The reason is because they are collecting if it is for bees, even for butterflies and moths, they are feeding on sugary substance produced by the flower called nectaris. And bees are collecting nectar so that they can be able to make honey. And then again for birds, even these birds and mammals, they also with the intention of feeding on nectar of the flowers. So we are saying that these agents can affect distribution of these organisms. So realize that organisms or given plants will be more uh, comfortable or will be growing more where we have their pollinating agents. Presence of pollinating agents will determine presence of some plants. So plants will be found more will be found more in areas with more of the pollinating agents and specifically for animals specifically for animals. There is a very tight relationship between animal pollinators 
and the plants. That's why you realize that for this type of flowers that are animal pollinated, they are highly specialized. They'll be specialized. So that as specialization goes higher, we are going to have very fewer of the animals, very few of the animals pollinating it. We have an, an example of the yucca plant. Yucca plant is highly specialized. Yucca plant flowers is highly specialized for pollination by a moth called yucca moth. The yucca moth, because it is highly specialized for that. So you can see there's a very tight relationship between the yucca plant and the yucca moth in that not any other insects or any other animal can be able to pollinate this plant. So the only pollinator here is the yucca moth. So we shall find more of the yucca moth where we have the yucca plant. So it means the yucca plant is affecting distribution and abundance of the yucca moth in that given ecosystem. For us to find yucca moth, we just find the yucca plant because there is a very tight relationship between the yucca plant and the yucca moth. So of worth noting is that those flowers that are animal pollinated, that are animal pollinated, insects and all those, those animals that we have mentioned, there is some specific characteristics that will enable those flowers to be able to be pollinated by those organisms. So some of the features that flowers usually put forward for purpose of pollination by animals include the size. Most of the flowers that are animal pollinated, irrespective, if you compare them vis-a-vis -vis, uh, wind or water, they are usually large, large in size. And because they are large in size, they also come with being conspicuous. They are large and conspicuous. The other feature is color. Most of the flowers that are animal pollinated will be colorful, brightly colored. Brightly colored. The colors can come in varieties. Some are red. You will find that some are pink, yellow, and several others. Also, a very important feature for animal pollination is sand. Sand, that is sand. They produce some good aromas. Some of the flowers produce some good uh, sand so that it can now attract some nice, some nice odors so that it can be attract or can be able to attract animals for pollination. But for mammals, this is majorly for insects. There's a slight difference with mammals in that mammals would be attracted by slightly dull uh, colored flowers, but with strong odor. Maybe it's producing some smell, that odor. So for mammals, for mammals, they are attracted by dull colored flowers. But those flowers with strong, with strong odor. Now, there's no much on pollination as an interactive relationship, but what we should know is that there's that plant pollinator relationship from pollination. Plant pollinator 
relationship. Just like we have given other examples that most pollinators will be found where there is appropriate plant for the pollination. In other words, there is a, a specialization of the flowers to be pollinated by particular pollinators. Just like we have already given uh, an example, the yucca plant and the yucca moth. And the yucca moth. E.g. the yucca plant and the yucca moth. So, for us to get this very clearly, we can look at the following questions to help us. So, one of the questions is, question one, distinguish between pollination and fertilization. Distinguish between pollination and fertilization. So we can use a table here slightly and fertilization. So we have already done something here, so it's very easy for us to remember pollination. From wherever you are, you can be able to answer this very easily. We have said pollination is the transfer of pollen grains from the other to the stigma of the same flower, of the same plant, or a different plant, but of the same species transfer. of pollen grains from the answers to stigma of same flower or it could be of different flower, not particularly of the same, but of same species. So when it is same species is when we say it is pollination. But if pollen grains will fall on the stigma of a different species, then there's no pollination, fertilization fertilization. Now fertilization, we have said after pollination, what follows is fertilization. Fission of male gametes with female gametes in the embryo sac to form a zygote. Fission of male gametes. So sometimes the word gametes is substituted with nuclei, nuclei, because there are two of them, two. And it's the nucleus that usually carries the genetic material, fission of male gametes with female gametes, with female gametes to form, to form a zygote. Previously, we have mentioned that his zygote will now uh, be able to develop into a, an ovule. Another thing about fertilization, uh, pollination, we have said that transfer is physical and is external. So it's an external process from the answer to the stigma, just, just an external process. But fertilization usually takes place inside the structures of the flower, the, through the style and then in the embryo sac. So this one is an external process, is an external process. But fertilization is an internal process.
is an internal process. Then question two. Question number two, describe the features of wind and animal pollinated flowers. Describe the features of wind and animal pollinated flowers. So for us to describe properly, we are going to use the following features. This is uh, animal. Then plant. So we shall be looking at the flower features like we can look at the petals the petals now for animals uh, not plants insects or wind eh? wind 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 sorry for that this is wind wind pollinated animal pollinated wind pollinated so we look at the petals we can look at the size what do you expect the size of the petals for animal pollinated flowers to look like now we have said for animals the type of flower that will uh, be pollinated they are usually dull so if they are dull petals not need to be large so if it is wind that is for animal they have to be seen they have to be large specifically insects large color should be bright brightly colored brightly colored and because of this large brightly colored petals then the size of the flower becomes mix <coughs> flower to be large in size <coughs> to be large so if it is large it becomes conspicuous So animal pollinated petals will be large, brightly colored, and conspicuous. And then the contrast for wind pollinated will be opposite. Large, it is small. Bright, it is uh, uh, dull. And then conspicuous, small in size. So the petals are small, dull, and less conspicuous conspicuous so because of this the size of flowers is small small sized flowers we can look at other structures like nectaries nectaries now when you talk of nectary these are glands that are found in the flower that secretes sugary substance called nectar so for animal pollinated flowers most of the time animals will be visiting flowers to get nectar so for nectaries it means for animal pollinated flowers they'll have nectaries to produce nectar have nectaries 
the role of nectaries to secrete, secrete nectar, secrete nectar that attracts animals, attracts animals. For wind, wind ha does not uh, need to be attracted to the flower. Therefore, there's no need of nectaries. No nectaries or absence of nectaries. Then the other feature is the sand. Sand. Does it produce any a good smell for animals? They'll produce like insects to be attracted, like mammals to be attracted, the flower must be producing the scent. So the flowers will be scented, scented, scented. But here, not scented. Then four, the others. How will be the anthers on this type of flowers? The anthers. For animal pollinated, like insects pollinated flowers, the anthers are usually firmly held. They're usually firmly held onto the flower onto the filaments. So they are firmly held onto the filament. This is important so that when insects, for instance, are brushing through the flower, the filament will remain firm, the other will remain firm, and in the process, they are able to pick the pollen grains. So they are firmly held onto the filament and within the flower and found and found within the flower for purpose of increasing the contact between the insect for instance and so for answers we are saying the family held onto the filament they are found within the flower so that now it can increase the contact between the insect and the flower or the others to increase the ability to pick uh, uh, pollen grains. But for wind, for wind, you'll realize I'll, we shall be able to find some uh, models of the same, wind pollinated and animal pollinated. If I may just draw something here, if that is the answer, and then that is the filament, the tip of the filament. This, this uh, answer usually uh, pivot, it will be pivoting from one side to another side, depending on the swaying by wind. So this is important so that it can easily release pollen grains into the air. So in other words, in contrast to animal wind pollinated flowers, the others is loosely held onto the filament so that when shaken, it can easily release the pollen grains. So here, they're loosely attached. It's loosely attached onto the filament. Loosely attached onto the filament to easily release to easily release pollen grains. The other structure, so it's going to release pollen grains when swayed by wind. 
can add that when swayed by wind. We can also look at other structures like the stigma. Five, stigma. How is going to be this stigma for animal? And maybe take example of uh, uh, wind pollinated flower. Stigma. Stigma is usually club shaped. Is club shaped and firm. Club shaped means it looks like that. So that now, again, apart from just increasing, uh, uh, apart from just being like that, is going to increase surface area for uh, to be able to to trap to trap pollen grains. Club shaped. Is club shaped. And firm and sticky. Sticky is important so that when pollen grains falls on it, they become attached completely. So it's going to be club shaped, firm and sticky. And then for wind, there's surely long, long stigma, a long stigma, and feathery. So if this is the stigma, it's not just going to be one like that, but it could be long. It may form uh, several branches, feathery long stigma and feathery. Why should it be like that? So that it forms a net. To form a net. For trapping. For trapping pollen grains. Pollen grains floating in air, pollen grain that are floating in air. So that's why it is highly branched, feathery, like. The other structure is the pollen themselves, pollen grains themselves. Six pollen. So for animal, one of them is uh, they are supposed to stick on the body of the animal. They are supposed to be large and they are supposed to be heavy. So they are large, heavy, and sticky. This is important so that they can easily attach themselves on the body of the insect as the insect moves from one flower to another. Then the contrast is true for wind pollinated. They'll be small, they'll be light, so that they can easily be carried by wind, and they are smooth. So they'll be small, smooth, and light to be easily carried, to be easily carried by wind to be easily carried by wind then the last structure is the corolla itself the structure of the corolla is it tubular or none seven shape of corolla Corolla is the petals and sometimes together with the sepals. So for animal pollinated flowers, most of them, this is how they look like. 
they'll form this kind of structure. So that now the stigma may be just appearing, there are filaments and that funnel shaped. It will have a shape of the funnel tube. It will form a tube. Forming a tube, maybe up to that point we have nectaries like that. Here the ovary. So it is tubular, funnel shaped. This is important so that when the insect lands here, it will be guided from that point to that structure that produces nectar. Remember, we called them as nectaries, or a nectar if it is one. So, what to remember? It will be in form of a tube, funnel shaped to direct the insects to the location of the nectaries. So it will be tubular, funnel shaped, and funnel shaped, funnel shaped to direct, to direct insects, to direct insects, or if it is small animals, to nectary, which is important. Now, wind pollinated flowers, corolla we have said is the petals. For wind pollinated flowers, most of them lack the petals. And the male and female part are simply enclosed in leaves that has be, have been modified to form, leaves that have been modified into structures that look like, that look like flowers. Those structures are called bracts. So they lack corolla. Instead, the male and female parts, male and female parts, female and male parts are enclosed, are enclosed in bracts. So the Maybe a new term, bracts. Bracts are simply leaves that have been modified. Leaves modified. Leaves modified. Into flower like structures. Into flower like structures. This is very common with a flower called um, Bougainvillea, where we have the Bracts. Then the last question. Is this. Briefly explain plant pollinator relationship. Briefly explain. Plants. Pollinator Pollinator relationship. So in other words, what do you expect of this? Where we have, we have already talked about this, that where we have uh, appropriate pollinators for a plant, we shall have more of the the plants that are supposed to be pollinated, and vice versa. So the plants are attracting pollinators. So in, the, in that ecosystem, if we want to find bees, we expect that we shall find bees where we have maybe a garden of flowers and something like that. We used an example of the yucca plant and the yucca moth. So in other words, if we alter <laughs> the population of the plant, the population of the pollinators is also going to be affected. 
So in other words, we might say that pollinators, pollinators will or are found, are found where there is, where there is plant specialized, specialized to be pollinated, to be pollinated by them, by them. E.g., we have used an example, e.g., the yucca moth. The yucca moth are found where there is, or there are more. They are where they are. The yucca plant. So because of this, if we disturb the population of yucca plants, Therefore, the population of yucca plant of yucca moth will also be disturbed. If population of yucca plant is altered, this may also alter population of yucca moth. So this is the kind of relationship we have been talking about. When one organism is affected, it affects the distribution of the of the other. That's why we are talking of plant pollinator relationship. Yucca plant yucca moth relationship. So I think with those questions you have been able to get the relationship very clearly. So thank you for your attention.